It's hard to imagine something as cruel and barbaric as human trafficking still existing in this day and age, but it does. And not just in some faraway country. It happens in the U.S. and even right here in Mississippi. New York Times best-selling author and Oxford, Mississippi resident Julie Cantrell delves into the dark and seedy side of this modern form of slavery in her latest novel, The Feather Bone. We welcome Julie to our MPB studios today. Julie, that's good to see you. Thank you so much. This is Love fun. the novel. Thank you. Yeah, it was a great read. I, I sat down and it was one that I picked up and I read for five hours and then I put it down, woke up the next morning and couldn't, I, I just rolled over and started reading it again. It was that good. Thank you. That's good to hear. <laughs> yeah, it's exciting. It's your third novel. It is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and your first one, Into the Free, um, I mean, if I started listing off all the awards it won, <laughs> we would be here for 30 minutes. Well, we're going to be here for 30 minutes, but we would be here talking about the award. Very well received critically. I mean, New York, on the New York Times bestseller list for three weeks. It won two Christie Awards, Mississippi Library Association Fiction Award. Uh, USA Today loved it. Yeah. How did that feel as a writer? Surreal, it really, yeah. especially as a debut novel. I yeah. mean, I just, I was thinking maybe my aunt and my mom would read it. You know, yeah. you just, you don't know that's coming. It was I'm, I'm still unbelievable to me. I still can't believe it when you list all that that you're talking about me. Yeah. Or we're, my work, not me. We're well, talking yeah. about you, too, because I think a lot of you is in the work. Uh, of course, yeah. yeah. Any, yeah. In anybody's work. You know? Oh, exactly. Yeah. No, I mean, it is. And one of the things I loved about, I was reading an interview about how you write, and I'm always interested about that because, I mean, I tend to try to be a creative person, too. When you write, you don't work from an outline. I can't. I have friends that do. I think every writer has their own process. Yeah. I wish I was that organized yeah. and my brain just does not work that way. So even when I have gone in with my second and third novel and tried to outline or even block out scene by scene, mm -hmm. it never goes that way. The story just shapes itself and I just have to surrender to that. That's a lot more go. fun though, isn't it? Cause it's you, a lot more fun. You're taking a journey and you don't know where you're going to hit to a turn and then you go off in a different direction. I never know what my characters are going to do uh, before they do it and they surprise me. Sometimes they upset me or make yeah. me angry because they're not me. Right. So they're doing things I wouldn't do or I may not understand, uh, but I have to let them go where they go. You know. Your, your characters um, go through some pretty tough things and they face do. some really dark situations. But the thing I love about your writing is that there's always that under that golden thread of hope and faith that run through every every character. I hope so. Yeah. I mean, I, I try to build characters that are believable because I don't know anybody who has an easy, perfect life. Right. Everybody I know has a hard journey. Maybe not all the time and maybe not every way that my characters do, but we all have that point where we're on the floor, you know, with our arms in the air saying, is there a God? You know, yeah. and if so, why are you doing this to me? Exactly. Um, and that's what I try to bring my characters to that point and then see how they get out of it. And see, and, and they do. Now, the new book is The, the Feathered Bone. And talk about the, the origin of the title, because I think that that's really important to the whole theme of the book. Thank you. I, I love the title. Um, I was, uh, to me, it symbolizes the theme of the book, mm -hmm. which is the, the feathered bone. It has a lot of symbolic meanings, a lot of layers to that title. But one of the things that triggered the title was long ago, women were forced or expected to wear corsets. Right. Corsets were made of very st uh, rigid steel rods or even whale bones, mm -hmm. very rigid materials to hold us in, right? Right. Shape our bodies in the shape that men expected them to be in. And so there's symbolism there to the extent we go as women to contort or shape our, our bodies, but even our minds and our right. spirits to gain love and acceptance from men, usually. Um, there's something we need to learn from that. And so as women, we fought to get out of the practice of having to wear corsets. I mean, mm -hmm. this was at an age when even young girls, as young as eight and nine, were forced to wear corsets and measure their waist wow. in school yeah. to make sure their waists were shrinking. And sometimes men would line women up and, and wrap their hands around their waist. And if their hands could meet, then they were an eligible bachelorette you know, for a wife. And if not, <laughs> back to the pile. Yeah. Um, that was how we were measured as worthy or not. Right. And so we've learned a lot of lessons as women over the years of what makes us worthy of love and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. And we need to relearn some of those lessons. And, and you touch on that in the book. And the, the protagonist, Amanda, is, uh, I, I, I said earlier to you as we were talking that she goes through some things that you know, I think even Job would sit there and go, wow, you poor thing. 
she goes through some tough stuff. The book is structured over five years. Mm -hmm. It's a three-act book. And in the middle, of course, is Hurricane Katrina, which I thought was just a, an amazing metaphor for a lot of the, the pain and the destruction that goes on in the book. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we do have these storms that blow in in our lives. Yeah. And, um, and, and they pass. But when you're in the middle of the storm, you don't always know if you're going to survive it or not. Right. And even when they pass, you're changed. We're yeah. changed by that trauma. So uh, how do we come back from that? And revisiting Hurricane Katrina as, you know, Louisiana is my home. That's where yeah. my family is. So revisiting it 10 years later, I had a lot to learn, too, and a lot to ask myself. Like, what have we learned from that experience? Right. And what do we learn from all of the traumatic experiences in our lives as individuals? I will say this. You're, you're riding on the storm was so perfect in the sense that you had folks that weren't right in the New Orleans area. They were up a, a little bit farther away, kind of like we were here in Jackson. And they had a, a, they couldn't quite see what was going on because they had no news. They had everything else. And then when they were finding out how bad things were, I mean, I felt that pain all over again. Exactly. When I, when Hurricane Katrina hit, we were already living in Oxford, Mississippi. Three or four days went by before I could contact my relatives around Louisiana. Yeah. And when I finally reached my mother in Baton Rouge, she had no idea what was happening in New yeah. Orleans. The rest of the nation was horrified. We were all watching horrified. Right. An hour away, nobody knew. It, they were that quickly disconnected from one another, you know, when you think about the impact. So I wanted to show how the surrounding parishes were affected, right. not only immediately, but following the storm, all the refugees coming in, and how it shaped the demographics of Baton mm -hmm. Rouge and the surrounding parishes permanently. It was a huge migration after Katrina. And, and your writing is so, I mean, very clear and very beautiful. I love this right there. This is the, basically in one of the opening lines in the book. So here we are in New Orleans where thick milky fog rises from the river like steam. Uh, you hooked me at that point. Yay. And I could almost taste the beignets. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was just amazing. But so much, the early setting up of the book is you've got a field trip. Right. They're coming from Walker, Louisiana, right. which is where you grew where up. Where I grew up. So you're writing about home. And it's home. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're right. And you can tell in the detail and the texture of your writing, but you, you've got a field trip and you've got kids. And a lot of parents understand this horror of going with 30 kids and coming back with 29. Talk about set that up for people, because there was so much early on in the book that, that played into like everything from them going to Algiers and finding out that's where slaves were sent off from market and that was an important part of the book, too. It was an important part. I'll touch on the slavery part first, yeah. because uh, sure. right in, if you take the ferry right across from the Central Business District to Algiers yeah. in New Orleans, um, you, you, you will go to a little community called Algiers. Mm -hmm. Not that long ago in Algiers, slaves were shipped in, and they were held in what were called slave pens yeah. right there across from the Central Business District. And it was essentially a feedlot for slaves. And so they were bricked in high brick walls and piled in by the hundreds or thousands in mm -hmm. these small container cells, yeah. men, women, children, and they were fattened up for market. So they were fed pork and, you know, heavy fats, and they were cleaned up and shipped across on the ferry back to the central business district where they were auctioned off. And so if there's no... You can go to Algiers today, you have no idea that happened. I had no idea. There's no marker. Yeah. There, you know, there's there's... It's just a normal community. And so how quickly we forget right. the dark undercurrents that built us. Um, but what, what was fascinating to me and what I tried to show in the book is that there are these children here learning about the horrors of human slavery. Right. How horrible that we did this to one another. We would, thank goodness there are no slaves today. And yet, on that same river, in that same city, people are being sold today. Yeah. It, it may not be on market on an auction block, you may not walk past someone chained and being, you know, bid on yeah. out in the open. But if we close our eyes to the to the undercurrents of human trafficking that are really are happening right in front of us, then we're just as wrong as the people buying and selling those slaves. We have to open our eyes and talk about it and do something about it. I, I tell you, there were so many parts of this book that as a parent, I kind of felt myself getting a little uptight because part of it was I'm naive. Yeah. And, and you want to be naive, but you realize you really have to work hard to protect your children from the world. But that scene where Sarah disappears, I, I've lost my child for 30 seconds, and I thought I was going to die. 
Exactly. You know, I mean, I can't even imagine. The, the, and you write about the aftermath of that so well, about how people are suspected that are innocent and, and everything else, and, and just the sheer terror that the parents feel, and that, of course, the guilt, because Amanda feels like that she lost the child. Exactly. You know, as a mom, and mm -hmm. I'm a speech pathologist in the schools, and I've chaperoned my share of school <laughs> field trips, it is my biggest fear to go on a field trip, be responsible for these children, and come back without one. Right. And so what I wanted to tap into was that primal fear that I have, um, but not just how that, that kidnapping would affect the child and her parents, but the chaperone, the school teacher, the buddy of the day, the bus driver, the superintendent, the church community, you know, everybody that's connected to that one life. And in a community like Walker, you know, we're very connected. Right. And so something that happens to one of us happens to all of us. That split second of time affected everybody's lives mm -hmm. forever. And so how do we cope with that trauma? How do we, how do we process it? How right. do we survive it with our souls intact? We can survive it, but do we shut down and become hard? Do we live in fear or anger? You know, how do we continue moving through traumas with our hearts open? Each character deals with the stress and the trauma in different ways and has a different journey. And, yeah. y you know, I think Sarah, of course, her journey is one in the way she deals with it. She writes to a sparrow. She does. And where did the sparrow come from? Well, Sarah's a child, and yes. so she's still seeing things through a child's point of view. Um, and there's a magical realism to Sarah's voice yeah. a little bit. You know, there's, as you said, she's still in, in a way in that innocent, protected bubble she'd been in as she a child. She was 12 years old. 12 years old yeah. when she was taken. So she's plucked from, she's a preacher's child, yeah. southern, you know, community, and mm -hmm. a pretty protected little sphere. And then she's plucked and put into a whole entire different yeah. reality. And so she's trying to process the you know, the, the giant chasm between those two realities right. in the way that a 12 year old can do that. So I hope I got that right, I tried. Um, but the sparrow came from a real life experience in my own life that's going to sound crazy, yeah. uh, but I have opened myself to crazy, you know, like it, it's, it's <laughs> it, okay. It, it works for you. <laughs> crazy works for me. Yeah. Um, it's, there really was a sparrow that wrote this book with me and I say that in a light, you know, humorous sense, but it's true to me. She came to my window, she tapped at my window mm -hmm. every day, and if I moved around the house, she'd fly with me to different windows. Yeah. She was there with me. And whatever that means, whatever people want to turn that into, it's up to somebody. But uh, at first, I just thought it was crazy coincidence. And then I really, I let it, I let that inspire the story. And she, she really was with me until I finished that book. And now she's not. So it's, you know, she brought that story to me, I think. And I just am here to give it to readers that need it. You, you talk about the corset and the feathered bone and mm -hmm. how they start making corsets out of the, out of the wing bones and so forth and birds. And you talk about feathers being incredibly light, but being incredibly strong. Mm -hmm. And that's the way Sarah was. Right. And there's a fortune teller in the beginning of the yes. book that they visit in, yeah. they see on the streets in the French Quarter, you know, in front of the cathedral in New Orleans. Yeah. And um, she, she tells the girls an important message, you know, that, you know, feathers are, if they're used for what they're made for, they can mm -hmm. carry you up, you know, even give a soul flight to flight, yeah. you know. Right. Um, we as girls are taught a lot of things about our worth and right. uh, what we're, what we're for and who we are. We as people, not just girls, right. and boys too. I mean, we, we're doing some destructive things to our boys and our sons and our culture right now mm -hmm. um, that trickles down and affects families and everything else. So what the story is essentially about is getting back to that truth mm -hmm. of who we really are before we are hurt by right. life, before we start to believe the lies we're told about ourselves, mm -hmm. getting back to the truth that we are loved, we're born of love and we're born to love and to be loved. It's really as simple and as hard as that. Amanda is a counselor. She she's is. a mom, she's a wife, she's a friend, but she, through the course of the story, finds out that maybe her marriage isn't everything that she thought it was. And I, I thought her journey was incredibly empowering too. Yeah, Amanda is a social worker. Right. And she works in some really tough situations as a social worker, helping people out of really abusive or bad or traumatic situations in life. And she's able to help everybody else, yes. but she doesn't always know how to help herself. And that's very true of a lot of I counselors. Think, and a lot of people in general. A lot of people yeah. in general. We can help everybody else. We can't help our own, you know, <laughs> us. Right. Um, that's Amanda, and yeah. that's her story. So a reader might say, why doesn't she see it? She just, we, our normal is our normal. 
Right. And so it's a lot easier to see things on the outside than on the inside. And that's what Amanda has to come to learn on her own journey. You she, know? she faced some things in that second act. I'll be honest with you, as a parent, I was reading it going, this would break me. Yes. I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, that she, and I, I don't want to give away too much from the book, right. but it was tough. And, and one of the topics that you do touch about, touch on is there is actually a teen suicide in the in the book yes and that was a very difficult part of the story and unfortunately it's a story that you know a little too well I do my brother turned 19 on March 1st uh, his senior year in mm -hmm. high school and on March 2nd took his life Wow! so he was just a few months from graduation yeah. his life was just about to start yeah. and uh, and and that's when he gave up you know and decided that his life was no longer worth the fight worth right. the worth it um, and so I, and he was so loved. I mean, this right. was, you know, this was a, a boy that had every reason to live, mm -hmm. not an easy life, not an easy journey, right. um, but none of us do, right? right. Uh, so what makes one of us give up yeah. and another fight? And that's kind of what I explore in the story too. Um, the, the character that ends up taking you know, the, the suicide that happens in the book without giving it away right. um, is a very real scenario. Very real, yeah. No matter sometimes how hard we fight for someone and love someone, mm -hmm. sometimes we can't break through. And so in a way, that character was enslaved too. Yeah. But to the lies and the, the mental anguish and the depression, whatever term you want to put on it, got the best of her. Yeah, in a way, she, that character couldn't find the relief that even Sarah found. Exactly. Couldn't you know, find her way to freedom. She couldn't find her way to freedom on yeah. that. And it, it was, there was one part of the story that it was based on a real event, but there was somebody who did commit suicide because they were in a Walmart parking lot, of all places, watching people walk by, and the, and the guy said, you know what, and this guy did attempt, he didn't succeed, but he okay. said, if one person smiled at me, I won't do this. And nobody smiled at him. Three hours in the book, he yeah. describes, you know, I sat in front of Walmart for three hours thinking if one person smiles at me, I won't do it. And if you think about how many people walk in and out of Walmart yeah. in three hour period and nobody connected with him enough to let him know you matter. Right. I see you. And that sometimes that's all we need to know as people. We're born for a reason. Right. Our lives matter and it's worth the fight. I mean, and, I, I think about how many times I walk in the Walmart just looking at my phone. We all do. Yeah. We all kind of numb ourselves to not only the surrounding and the life that's all around us, but the people that are put in our paths for a reason. And sometimes all we need to do is make eye contact or smile or just, just you know, that's love. Yeah. And, and we all want to be loved. Amanda has a very difficult journey. And one of the places where she, I think, is a turning point in the book not to give too much away, is in the Blind River Chapel. Yeah. And the way you describe the Blind River Chapel in the book made me want to go there. And I thought, I wonder if this is a real place. So naturally, Curious Marshall <laughs> Googles it up and finds this is one of the most beautiful places of any place I've ever seen. Thank you. I think so. Yeah. Um, you know, and I've seen amazing cathedrals in Europe and around the world, yeah. and they're beautiful, no doubt, but they weren't made with the love and the faith that this little chapel in the swamps was created by. Um, the story goes like this. In the 80s, a woman by the name of Martha Dayrosh and her husband, Bobby Dayrosh, had retired to their camp on the Blind River in mm -hmm. Louisiana. It's a boundary river uh, by my parish, Livingston Parish. Yeah. And so I spent time there as a child. Uh, Martha has a vision. She's a devout Catholic. She sees in a, in a vision, um, the Blessed Virgin Mary tells her, you need to build a place here for the river people to come mm -hmm. feel close to God. She tells her husband this, and he says, okay. But he does it at <laughs> two in the morning. That's what right. was great. Yeah. You know, he, he just he doesn't tell her she's crazy. He doesn't tell her to shut up right. and go back to sleep. He says, I love you. I'll do it. You know, let's do it. And so together, they pull together like 12 to 15 friends from the river. Yeah. And these people haul cypress logs down to this spot where she had another vision of Jesus kneeling on a rock to tell her where to put it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, they, in three months' time, hand cut more than 3,000 cypress shingles to make the exterior of the chapel. Oh, wow. They floated down the river a giant cypress tree that had been struck by lightning. Mm -hmm. It's huge. And that's what they formed the grotto out of, that now there's an icon of Mary at the front of the church. They hand carved the pews. There's only six. It's a very tiny little simple building, uh, but it is of all the places I've been the most sacred spiritual space I've ever stepped into because it was made with 
pure faith and pure love and for community, for one another, for, for God. It's just, I mean, now there, there's paneling and there's a window unit, but the but if you open the windows and yeah. the black squirrels are chirping and the, the ducks are calling above you and the water's lapping up against the pier and it's just, it's God, you know, it's there. I think it's imp I'm impressive it survived Hurricane Katrina. Yes, it, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. I, know, I know there's still so many scars along the land even here in Mississippi from the storm. Yeah, you can go down the Blind River and like any of the wetlands, yeah. you can see evidence of the many storms that have pummeled over the over the years. Yeah. You know, there's trees that are, the tops are blown off from storms, there's watermarks from floods, there's, you know, very destroyed, destructive uh, camps that have been, you know, right. nearly taken back over by yeah. nature. It's all there. I loved, you have one character named Gator. He's the bus driver. And of course, Gator had a record, past record, and everybody suspected him initially. Like, you know, we always judge in the news and probably was judged on social media, although social media wasn't really around back then. But I loved what he had to say. He had some, some dogs he'd rescued from fighting. Yeah. And he had a great quote. He said, trust don't come easy once you've been in the ring. Love don't either. And, and I think about, you know, Amanda, after going through all the things that she went through, but at the end, she does figure out what love is. She does, but it takes her a while to, to trust what is real love. Yeah. Um, and when we've been hurt, right. and when we have trusted the wrong people, and that's kind of the, the point of the story too. There are always gonna be people in our lives, I believe, yeah. um, trying to draw us either to the dark or to the light. Yeah. And it's our job to kind of, kind of tap into that instinct and know who, who is for us and who is against us. Not everybody's against us, and not everybody's for us. And we just have to, have to find our way with love. Right, and I thought uh, I thought Sarah's story was just very powerful. Bridgette, who's the the lady who kidnapped her, right? Um, but she ends up making Bridgette realize that she's loved too. Right, that was so powerful. Oftentimes, um, abuse is cyclical. Yeah, it's generational. As I said, our normals are normal, and even when we we know what we want to get away from, oftentimes we fall right back into what's comfortable. Right, and so um, Bridgette. Um, or Brigitte, she, she was in this culture from a child. Yeah. And so it didn't, it, she had to learn some lessons too from yeah. this, from so, Sarah, which they end up having this really unique kind of beautiful relationship, but it's, it's a fractured, strange relationship because this is her abductor, um, but they each learn something from one another. The book is, is absolutely beautiful. And like I said, The Feather Bone, I do recommend you, you get a chance to read it. You're working on a new novel now. I am. <laughs> Knock I, on wood, it, I can get it done. Uh, a fourth novel that's going to be set in Oxford, Mississippi. Yeah. So I'll explore, again, what I write is um, I explore women's journeys. Yeah. And I just try to examine the, the relationships that we have as women, mm -hmm. whether with our mothers, our daughters, our friends, our husbands, uh, um, and, and the path that we, have, that we should take as women and, and all the obstacles we find in our way. But ironically... <laughs> Oh, and it's called lots of different things, but so many men relate to my stories. Mm -hmm. And when I, I just came from speaking at a high school down in Walker, Louisiana, mm -hmm. and every time this happens, the teachers are shocked by the junior high and high school boys who stay after to talk to me. Really? They can't believe it. And I said, you know, it, it's shocked me. They might have a crush on you. No. <laughs> uh, you will. Um, they are hungry yeah. for models yeah. of real men. Right. Good men. Because I'm a mother of a son. Our boys aren't right. born wanting to be abusive, right. wanting to hurt people. E boys want to be loved too. Somewhere along the way we break them and teach them the wrong model of what it means to be a man. And if you look at what they're shown in our culture, in our, in our media, in our mm -hmm. movies, in our books, they aren't given models of good men. And in my books I try to show the good men, that there are good men out there. And the sheriff. The sheriff's a good guy. He's a good guy. And, and the, my, those boys that read that book want more of that. So you can call it women's fiction, but those boys are finding something to tap into too, and that's beautiful to me. Well, it's, it's great that you're getting the, the, the reviews and the literary success, and it's selling well, and it's on the bestseller. Mm -hmm. You had one particular moment, though, when you got a starred review. 
starred review on my debut novel from yeah. Publishers Weekly, yeah. which at the time I was so green, I didn't even know what it meant. Uh, somebody sent me and I, I saw a little star bite. I was like, does this, I'd heard, you know, starred review, but I, nobody told me my phone started buzzing and I thought something was wrong. Because when your phone starts going off like crazy, my first thought, after, you know, you lose someone to suicide, yeah. your first thought is, oh no. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I was scared to even answer or listen because I thought, what has happened? And it turned out it was a starred review. It was, it was awesome. a wonderful thing, but uh, it did really change my life. It was amazing. You're kind of like a superhero. During the day, you're mild-mannered speech <laughs> pathologist, and then mm -hmm. you disappear. Your students are like, where did she go? And you're off at a book review. It, it is true. I wear a totally different hat during the day at middle school, you yeah. know, as a speech therapist, and I don't think many people there even know I write. Um, so I have a very, you know, different hat. And then I wear my mom hat. My kids couldn't care less that I'm a writer or, yeah. you know. And then, you know, I get to do this kind of play part of my life on the side. It's one of the beauties of being in Oxford, though. It is. Because like you said, you get to bump up against so it many is. talented people. It's an amazing community. It, it really, really is. is. I don't know that I would be a published novelist today if I had not moved there and met people who were doing it and living that life. Because, And they're just normal people. You know, I had we all had this bizarre idea of the drunken novelist in his basement, you know, antisocial. It's, you know, we're all making pancakes for our kids and sitting in carpool line writing our stories. You know, it's, um, it's, it's interesting to live in a place where that's a reality and not a fantasy. Right. You can live with your art. You get the role models that way. You get the models, yeah. you see? That's great. Yeah. Well, Julie, I mean, congratulations on your success. And I, Thank you. I tell you what, I mean, your next book is coming out in 2017. I hope. Yeah. <laughs> if so, I can get it finished. I, as soon as I get out of here, I got to get, get, get back to writing. <laughs> exactly. But, but I'm, I'm very, I mean, proud of all your successes so far, and I do look forward to the next book. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you reading it. That'd be great. Yeah. That'd be great. Well, we'll see you next time on Conversations. Mm -hmm.